Welcome back to the Career Profiles podcast. I'm your host, John, joined as always by Johnston for the final part of the Henry Armstrong Career Profile, the final episode of this round of the Career Profiles series for 2023. And what a way to finish the season and the year off with a fantastic tale. And you guys that are listening, I'm sure will have listened to part one. But if you haven't, get on to part one first before you listen to this. Part one gives you all the life going into his boxing career of Henry Armstrong. And then it goes all the way up to him winning three titles in the space of 10 months in three different weight categories holding all them titles at the same time. It was a great way to end the first part, and many people might have thought that that would have been a way to end his career profile, but of course it isn't, because his career does go on quite significantly after this point, which is why we've done it as a two-part episode on Henry Armstrong, and this second part will document everything that he does following that legendary, iconic moment that he created in history, Johnston. Huge. I mean, it's so significant, wasn't it? And when you think of the name Henry Armstrong, you think of those three titles, those three world titles and three separate weight divisions that he held simultaneously. It's a remarkable feat and one that will never be repeated in terms of the divisions. I mean, we have the super divisions and the the light divisions, etc. But no one's ever going to do that again. Nobody in the history of the sport. So that's why he's so iconic. And it's a great way to end it because, you know, he is a... He's a champion in three different weight classes. And uh, what does he do after that? People, again, you know, they, exactly as you said, Sean, that's almost it. And then they, that's it. That's what you remember of Henry Armstrong. But there is more to him. He has to defend those, one of or two of them, and, and how how they go and how he loses them. And if he wins them back, et cetera. Look, it's, it's all great stories in here. And uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be a great ending to the career profile series. And of course, to Henry Armstrong's career profile. So, as we said, we're going to pick up where we left off from part one, which is where we ended it with him winning his third world title in a third weight class, holding all three titles simultaneously. Now, his third title came when he defeated Lou Ambers for the lightweight title. So we are going to continue with the aftermath of that historic victory. Henry had weighed in at £134 before the Ambers fight. And after the bruising 15-round encounter, he weighed 129 pounds. The Times magazine said that when referee Billy Kavanagh held up Armstrong's arm in victory, Henry Armstrong was so exhausted that he probably could not have pronounced his own title, world's featherweight, lightweight and welterweight champion. In his dressing room, the world's first triple ring champion, who had just earned $20,766 in 45 minutes, cracked no smiles. The reason? He had a split lip. Edward Brennan of the New York Journal America and Boxing Illustrated went into detail on what happened in the dressing room. He wrote that Henry Armstrong lay on the leather-covered rubbing table in a stuffy dressing room. He was moaning and spitting blood as Dr. Alexander Schiff bent low over him to begin the messy job of sewing him up. As the doctor set the last of the painful stitches, Armstrong's leg started to thrash about. Quietly, the doctor berated him. Easy, Henry, this is the last one. As Dr. Schiff put away his needle and thread, Henry whispered something into his ear. Hurriedly, a pail was held close to the fighter's face, and he vomited into it. There was a general exclamation at the amount of blood which cascaded into the pail, Henry needed 37 stitches in his mouth, three above his left eye, and two over his right. Wow. Well, Dr. Alexander Schiff had told Eddie Mead, who's the manager from the first part of it, as you remember, uh, after the Ambers fight, it would require two and maybe three months for the lip to mend properly, and Armstrong will need an additional month to get into condition. Henry has one of the worst cuts in his mouth I've seen in 30 years tending to fight as wounds. Now, while Henry rested his wounds, he decided it best to give up his featherweight world title in September 1938, so the triple world champion was no more, but he would defend his two other titles in good time. All the while, Eddie Mead, well, he gambled his share of the purse and Henry's from the Ambers fight. 
Henry actually said one day on a flying visit to the Ring Magazine offices that Eddie Mead was a very good manager and I have no complaints. I feel he meant well, but he just wasn't made to handle the kind of money we were getting. I'd be tipped off that property in the San Berahino Valley was a good thing and I went to Eddie about buying some. Don't go for that, Henry yelled. I let Lynch, Eddie's old fighter, Joe Lynch, buy himself a water hole and he went busted. Real estate is too risky. Stay away from it. Now, excuse me. I'll see you later. I'm going to the racetrack. So Henry's first offence was for the worldweight title and it came against Sefero Garcia at Madison Square Garden just over three months after the Luambas win. Henry actually wore his new dressing gown to the ring that night for the Garcia fight. He had a, a skull and a crossbone on the back. Now, rather than give you the fight details in an article, we're going to let Henry Armstrong recount a moment in the fight. And this is what he said. He said, Garcia was the hardest puncher I ever fought. He had that bolo punch, a sort of wild sweeping hook or uppercut. His bolo was a very heavy punch. It hurt you all over. He hit me with the hardest shot I ever took. I had a special mouthpiece made to protect that old lip scar. But my seconds were nervous and they forgot to shove it in before the 11th round started. They called to me and when I turned my head to see what they were yelling about, Garcia hit me with a right hand bolo to the chin that lifted me three feet off the canvas. To this day, I say that I was unconscious when I fell. But I landed on my hands, causing my neck to snap partially reviving me. I looked up and saw four Garcias. I jumped right up and in doing so, my head slammed against his chin. That shook him up. I grabbed him, twisted him, punched him hard and kept him busy until I recovered. Had Seferino known how badly I was hurt, he could have knocked me out easily. Henry managed to take a 15 round decision against the excellent Puerto Rican Columnist Joe Williams wasn't too impressed with Henry, even after everything he had already achieved. But his judgment was called into question after the Garcia fight, who was much bigger than Armstrong and went into the fight as the favourite. Williams wrote, Fighting against a pygmy of a man with every material advantage on his side, weight, reach and punch, Garcia was beaten. Henry Armstrong, a legitimate lightweight, whose industry, ambition and fearlessness have carried him into heavier fields, was clearly the superior in the 15-round test. This was supposed to be a test between a good big man and a good little man, and it was up to the point where the intangibles became important. And he continued, he said, when this point was reached, it was a no contest. Practically from the beginning, Armstrong made the heavier Garcia fight his kind of fight. At least he was always trying to make him do this. I've never thought Armstrong was a great fighter, but I'm beginning to fear I underrated him. The fellow always keeps winning. He beats the little fellows, he beats the fellows his own size, and when they throw him in there with the big fellows, he takes care of them too. There isn't much else you can ask for, is there? Rex Hess in the Lincoln Star wrote about Henry's second defence of that worldweight title, stating that Armstrong had declared that he was not taking Al Manfredo lightly. So this was the next defence. Saying that Manfredo is a better boxer than Garcia. And that the 26-year-old challenger brought a 67-19-8 record with 24 knockouts to the ring and was confident throughout his training here. He said, I've seen Armstrong fight and I think I know how to beat him. He was wrong. Manfredo was another victim of the tireless Russian attack of the Los Angeles man, who actually went on to stop him in the third round. Now, in a bout billed as for the welterweight title, both Armstrong and, again, from the very first part of this episode, or this whole career profile, Baby Arizmendi, weighed in at just over the lightweight limit. So it's 134 and a half pounds and 36 pounds, respectively, for a 10-rounder. Now, Robert Mayers of the Ironwood Daily Globe explained, duplicating their last two clashes, it was a gruelling battle for 10 rounds that kept the fans in an uproar, with both fighters standing toe-to-toe, shoulder-to-shoulder, 
like two tiny balls. The Aras Mendy left the ring a beaten man, one side of his face covered with blood and the cheers from his countrymen ringing in his ears. He could point to a record unequaled by anyone else in this fight game. Robert Reyes wrote, He, as in Aras Mende, had just finished his 52nd round opposite Henry Armstrong, with never a knockdown scored against him, nor had he been seriously hurt. In the final counting, it was Armstrong's relentlessness and more powerful punches that brought him referee George Blake's decision. Booed several times for his jerky shoulder movements in the clinches and his bobbing head, Armstrong lost at least one round for accidentally butting. Following this, Armstrong travelled to Havana in Cuba to make a second defence of his world welterweight title against Bobby Pacho, who outweighed the champion by some £13. This was the first world title fight in the Cuban capital since Jess Willard knocked out Jack Johnson in 1915. The bout was refereed by the former heavyweight champion, Jim Braddock, in front of 10,000 fans. The end came in the fourth round when Armstrong floored the challenger, forcing Braddock to drag Pacho back to his corner, who was then assisted out of the ring. Lou Feldman was next for a homecoming at St. Louis. He was destroyed in one minute and 12 seconds of the first round as Armstrong defended both his lightweight and welterweight titles. Two weeks later, and Henry defended his welterweight crown at Madison Square Garden against a home crowd favourite. It took 12 rounds for Armstrong to finally stop Davy Day, but in the process, he was cut over the left eye, which needed four stitches, and fractured his left hand in the fifth. Barring a couple of deducted points for low blows, Henry won every round and used his right hand for good measure to finish off Day, who had never been stopped before. That was his sixth defence of the welterweight title in just over four months. Well, to say they don't make him like Henry Armstrong anymore would be an understatement. Champions in his day, before and after, were never as near active as the great homicide Hank. Reporter Harry Ferguson of the Ogden Standard Examiner wrote that Davy was still mumbling like a stumble bum a half an hour after the fight was over, but his biggest regret was that he failed to avenge his stablemate and friend, Barney Ross, who of course Henry Armstrong absolutely busted in part one. In Henry Armstrong's autobiography, it was explained that Eddie Mead was a happy fella. I bet he was. He was uh, taking his double champ abroad, to London no less, to fight the British welterweight champion, Ernie Roderick. They had been on a personal appearance tour with heavyweight Joe Lewis as an added attraction before uh, the Arismundi fight and Eddie liked the thrill of going places and seeing things. His enthusiasm was contagious. He didn't have much trouble selling Henry on the idea of a trip to England. So Henry wore a cast the day he boarded the Queen Mary uh, for his trip to London. Accompanying with him was his wife and his daughter Lanetta uh, Harry Armstrong and his wife, Eddie and his other half, and Eddie Walker, and the future featherweight champion, Chalky White, also went with him. But 10 days before the fight, Drew Middleton was writing from London, and this is what he wrote. He said, The British boxing public have gone completely nuts over Henry Armstrong. Four weeks after landing to start work for his welterweight title defence against Ernie Roderick on May 25th, Henry is the talk of the pubs and the pride of the publicists. They didn't know what to make of him at first, but they like him fine now. The sports writers who journeyed down to meet the Queen Mary expected a cross between the late Bert Williams and Battling Siki. What they found, of course, was a mild-mannered little guy travelling with his wife and daughter. He did not brag. He used good English. His clothes were seemly. His manners were perfect. He did everything right. He spoke proudly of his race. He knocked them off their feet by showing them samples of the poetry that he had written. Eddie Walker recounted that a bedazzled journalist asked, Tell me, is this really Armstrong? But he and his fellow word painters went away, enchanted. 
The next day, there were pictures of the sad-eyed little Negro and lengthy stories in every London paper. But what really got them was Henry's intelligence and courtesy. One critic wrote, Armstrong is the finest character I have ever met in boxing. He is a credit to his race and to his country. Henry was knocking the Brits Bambi with an intelligence that they'd never seen before when dealing with a boxer. J.C. Dirks of the Salt Lake Tribune explained, when his training periods are over, Henry talks about his poetry and submits it to fellow writers and he discusses the book he is writing with his fellow craftsmen. All of this is so contrary to preconceived notions of what a prize fighter is generally supposed to be, that England is virtually at Henry Armstrong's feet. Armstrong then defended the welterweight title against Ernie Roderick at Haringey Arena on May 25th, 1939. Henry would get a purse said to be between £7,500 and £10,000, although another figure of £46,800 was also reported as being the biggest purse ever paid to a fighter in England. For his end, Roderick would pick up around £1,500. Unfortunately, because Roderick, the British welterweight champion, was a Liverpudlian, only 5,000 fans came out to see his challenge against Armstrong, meaning the stadium was only half full. Boxing news editor Gilbert E. Odd wrote, Those who stayed away missed seeing a phenomenal exhibition of non-stop battling, such as may never be witnessed again. They also missed a game and courageous display by Ernie Roderick that will never be forgotten. I shall always be personally indebted to Johnny Best for having provided the opportunity for me to see Henry Armstrong in action, the personification of perpetual motion. Although Roderick, with a height, weight and reach advantage, gave his best shot, he was still just outclassed, as confirmed by the United Press, who reported that with a hurricane of red leather that left his game opponent blood-smeared and groggy, Henry Armstrong of Los Angeles Thursday night retained the World Welterweight Championship by winning an easy 15-round decision over Ernie Roderick of Liverpool at Herringay Indoor Stadium. Armstrong made his sixth successful defence of the £147 crown. He registered his 46th straight ring victory despite the handicap of nearly £11. Henry weighed 135 to Roderick's just over 145 pounds. Well, after the fight, Henry praised his opponent's resilience and desire. He said, he was a fine game boy. I'm sorry I couldn't put up a better fight, but both my hands are sore and bruised. Well, the Associated Press confirmed the extent of Henry's damaged hands by this point when they reported from London that Henry Armstrong who had badly bruised both his hands in punching Ernie Roderick's Gibraltar draw, will take a complete rest until he goes into training about the middle of July for his second fight with Lou Ambers uh, in New York on August 9th. An easy victor last night, Armstrong nevertheless damaged his hands so seriously he will consult doctors here in Paris. Trainer Harry Armstrong, who they sometimes call his brother, said apparently no bones were broken, but the hands were swollen and a complete rest was required. What Henry did next was described in his autobiography. Now, he said he toured England and crossed the channel to take a look at Paris to a world-famous champion flush with money. It was a tour of triumph. Henry actually met Marcel Sedan, the great French middleweight, and he shook hands with Maurice Chevalier, who was a French singer and actor at the time, famous in France, obviously, and the crowds cheered him wherever he went. But they had also began cheering something and someone else. The clouds of war were settling over Europe. Troops were marching and the French were getting ready for it. They had begun to forget the visiting champ when he sailed for home. But Henry shouldn't worry. Eddie Meade put $20,000 in his hand his share of the profits of the Roderick fight. Money, money, money. Three months later, it was now time for Henry to prepare for his lightweight title defence against Lou Ambers at Yankee Stadium, a fight that would bring him $40,000. He prepared at Pompton Lakes in New Jersey 
a training camp he shared with the heavyweight champ Joe Lewis. A week before the fight, veteran columnist Grantland Rice visited the camp and wrote up his view of the lightweight champion. He said, Armstrong throws something like 60 punches a minute or 180 punches in a round. He admits he can't keep any record of the blows he delivers as he keeps both hands working at top speed from start to finish. He is sure, however, that he piled up more than 200 punches of one type or another in several single rounds. The answer to all this is inevitable. Hammering Henry's hands are not what they used to be. His swollen knuckles that I looked at some weeks ago have receded considerably and now look about normal. But the punishment they have taken through the last few years has been heavy. Armstrong hasn't any worry about his legs carrying him at the same pace through 15 rounds. He said they never felt better. They can go any distance. The thing that tired me in the last Amber's fight was my cut lip and the flow of blood that ran down my throat. It wasn't my legs or my arms. It wasn't the punches I threw. Well, going into the fight, Henry Armstrong was on this 46-fight winning streak with 39 of those coming by way of knockout or stoppage. And if there is one thing we know in this sport, especially during this time, is that the powers that be don't quite like a boxer to win all the time, and even more so if he was a black fighter. Now, to add to that fault, Lou Ambers had never lost a return bout in his career. He actually won rematches against Tony Kanzanieri and Fritzy Zivic, who actually broke his jaw once, apparently, and also Pedro Montanz. He wanted to preserve his record against Armstrong, and without giving too much away, so did the others within the boxing industry, or some within it. So James P. Dawson of the New York Times wrote this on this bout. So this is Emery Armstrong against Lou Ambers for the lightweight title. And he wrote, The bout was crowded with frills from the first bell to the last, but applying the law more severely than ever before and certainly more painful than it ever has been applied in a championship bout. Now, referee Donovan penalised Armstrong five rounds. So the second, the fifth, the seventh, the ninth and the eleventh all for low blows. And James P. Dawson continued in his article. He said the title was not won on competition alone, but on fighting rules and ethics. Four of these rounds Armstrong won on competition alone, without a doubt. On this observer's score sheet, Armstrong was the victim of an injustice, even taking into account the penalties of which he was the victim. Giving Ambers the benefit of the doubt in five rounds, he won by the ring's law enforcement. Armstrong still won the battle eight rounds to seven in the writer's opinion, in his opinion. Now, the observer's score sheet gave Hammering Henry the 4th, 6th, 8th, 10th, 12th, 13th, 14th for 15th rounds by wide margins. To Ambers, this reporter gave the first, second and third rounds on action together with the remaining four Donovan penalised Armstrong on fouls. And it continues the article and it says, So, it can be seen that this title was decided not on competition, but on fighting rules and ethics. Armstrong lost his title on fouls. The most that can be said for Ambers is that he fought gallantly. Not all the journalists felt this way. Nat Fleischer in particular reported that 13 newspaper writers had given the verdict, as did the three officials and I, in favour of Ambers, and 13 favouring Armstrong. Thus, Ambers, so far as the writers were concerned, won the title by one vote, that of the ring editor, the deciding one. However, Nat Fleischer does then go on to confirm, just as James P. Dawson did, that this fight was won on a pure technicality, and said... As some of the pictures in the movies and the stills show, several punches for which Henry lost a round were just a little below the belt line. This being the case particularly in the seventh round and referee Donovan didn't even warn Armstrong after its delivery, but ordered the officials to penalise him once the round was over. The 14th round, the one which according to most of the ringside experts was won by Hank, was given to Ambers 
by judge Frank Fulham. It was by far the best round of the defending champion. It was the contention of Armstrong that if Fulham had seen that round as most everybody else, his card would have read 8-7 to seven in Hank's favour and the title would have been saved. In his column, Today's Sport Parade, Henry McLenmore didn't pull his punches when he said, Arthur Donovan is the new lightweight boxing champion of the world. He won the title in Yankee Stadium last night. He won it for Lou Ambers by rendering a decision as questionable as a mongrel's paternity. McLemore did then confirm that both were fighting dirty at times and that both men should have been penalised, which would have meant that Armstrong kept his world title. Harry Ferguson of the Moorhead Daily News described Eddie Mead's reaction to these events when they unfolded. And he said, this is Eddie Mead, the customers almost saw a double header. Eddie Mead was screaming bloody murder at Donovan every time the referee took a round away from Henry for fouling. Between rounds, he would run over to Donovan, making furious motions as though he was going to throw a punch. Donovan shooed him back into the corner but when the bout was over, Meade really exploded in the dressing room. Meade yelled, they stole it from us. I'll beef so loud and long about this that there is no more boxing in New York in 90 days. Well, throughout the bout, as Donovan repeatedly penalised Armstrong for these low blows, Al Jolson and a group of his friends, so Al Jolson used to own part of Armstrong, so he kept yelling, that's all right, Henry. They are going to take it in a way. And shouted at Donovan to let them alone. Other fans near the ring were screaming fake. And it's no use, Henry. It's in the bag. So there you go. So just over 29,000 in attendance paid to get in that night at the Yankee Stadium. The receipts for the fight made just shy of 138,000 lying in the pockets of a very happy Mike Jacobs. And the Moorhead Daily News wrote again, contracts already had actually been signed for Armstrong to defend his welterweight against Ambers within 60 days in case Lou won the lightweight championship. And promoter Mike Jacobs announced that on the 1st of November and Madison Square Garden would be the time and the place. Why should I let Henry risk his other titles against Ambers? That's what Eddie Mead asked. Wouldn't it be just as easy for them to steal it as they did the lightweight title. I'm not in this business for my health, you know. The world championship doesn't grow on trees. Mead also claimed that three weeks ago, he had been warned something would happen to Henry last night. Mead quoted one of the boxing commissioners as saying, Armstrong would lose six rounds on fouls. Mead asked, that was three weeks ago, mind you, and how could he know that if something wasn't phony? Ambers was fouling every round for 15 rounds. Look at Henry's eyes. Ambers doesn't punch hard enough to do that kind of damage. He kept his thumbs in Henry's eyes in every round. And if Donovan thinks that's fair fighting, he ought to read the rule books again. So the rubber match was then set for December the 1st, 1939. But Henry got sick, so it was postponed. He then postponed it twice more before it was eventually cancelled. And they never shared the ring again. Gerald Suster reported, A long while later, Mrs Margaret Ambers told reporter John E. Heaney that after the men had retired from the ring, Armstrong paid a friendly visit to her home and told her that he had staged the delays because he had not wanted to fight her husband again. For his part, Ambers averred that Armstrong gave him his toughest fights, declaring he wasn't smart enough, but he was good. Henry had now grown out of the featherweight 126-pound class. Lou Ambers and referee Arthur Donovan had taken his lightweight title away, but he was still the welterweight champion of the world. Three of Henry's next five bouts were scheduled for 10 rounds, including one in California, where 15-round contests were not allowed, but all were bona fide title defences. He stopped four of the five. Only Jimmy Garrison managed to go the 10-round distance. Armstrong had defended the welterweight title five times within 22 days. He had scored a total of nine knockdowns in approximately 63 minutes and 25 seconds of fighting, a little more than 21 total rounds of actual 
ring combat. Well, to round off 1939, Henry took on Jimmy Garrison in a rematch in Cleveland and Joe Williams of the Syracuse Herald Journal pointed towards Henry's dramatic recovery from flu that postponed that Lou Amber's rubber match in his article. He said Armstrong, who two weeks ago called off uh, a title jam with Lou Amber's because of an attack of the flu, certainly has staged a most rapid recovery. Watching the sleek Negro glide around the arena battleground last night, one would never have thought he had been laid low by the flu bug. Henry was all gloves as he gave Jimmy Garrison a neat going over. He stopped him in seven rounds in this rematch. So Henry fought twice in January and it was his second bout, a a ninth round stoppage over Pedro Montanz that left the mark on boxing or as Joe Williams would put it a mark on him and boxing in general when he explains in great detail the end of this fight so he says one minute of the fourth round had passed when Armstrong caught Montans against the ropes and cracked him with right hand to the temple that shook and seemed to daze him he stood there against the ropes helpless blood dripping from an old cut over his right eye and Armstrong swarmed over him. Bang, bang, bang. One punch after another, as fast as Armstrong could throw them, faster than ringsiders in the press section could tabulate them. During the violent bombardment, he was sent down twice. He had never been on the floor, and he had a fierce pride in his record. Somehow, he managed to straighten up and regain a fighting posture. Once again, Armstrong beat him down on the way he fell into the lower rope in a sitting position and sat there while the referee's count gave him a temporary secease from the human fury in front of him. Nobody knows for sure exactly how many times he was hit, for by this time, Montanz was literally a human punching bag. A punching bag until the ninth round finish. How the Puerto Rican managed to survive another five rounds is beyond us. Joe Williams summed up the fight on boxing as a whole when he declared this was prize fighting at its ugliest and paradoxically at its emotional peak. It was a bloody, senseless, revolting slaughter, a helpless, dazed, hurt fighter being hacked to pieces. There never can be anything lovely about such a spectacle and yet it has these sickening senses that bring out human qualities which demand admiration. Out of the slaughter, Montanz emerged a heroic pattern in raw courage. No fighter in our memory ever gamed his way through such a cruel, relentless, almost unending attack. This was the round that cost him the fight, but it was also the round which established him as a gallant fighting man. Next up for Armstrong was a rematch with one of the greatest Filipino fighters to ever emigrate to America in Seferino Garcia. Now in their first fight, which we explained earlier in the episode, Harry Ferguson couldn't contain his admiration for Henry when he wrote, Armstrong, the little man, 134 pounds of driving dynamite, gave one of the great exhibitions of his great career in Madison Square Garden last night against Garcia, the big man, and won all the way. Standing in the haze of smoke at ringside, promoter Mike Jacobs announced that Armstrong, like Alexander, had whipped so many people He sighed for new worlds to conquer. Interestingly, Henry won nine of the 15 rounds by wide margins and lost only five, one of which was taken away from him by none other than referee Arthur Donovan because of, you guessed it, a low blow. Now it was time for the two to meet again, but this time it would be for the middleweight title recognised by the California and the New York State Athletic Commission's the title which Garcia had taken from Fred Apostole. Yeah, and there was another version of the middleweight title at the time, the NBA, but that wasn't on the line because that was held by Al Hostak. And however, the fight was only recognised by the California State Athletic Commission in the end because the fight was scheduled for 10 rounds instead of 15 and New York didn't sanction world title fights over 10 rounds. As described in his autobiography, Henry's autobiography that is, the week before the fight, 
Henry was training one morning and his trainer told him that there was a meeting he was supposed to attend at the gym on Main Street. Now he went meekly to the gym into a back room where he found several men standing around. One of them threw a pile of bills on the table. Henry estimated quickly that he thought it was about $15,000. Take it, said the stranger. It's yours. What for? asked the startled Henry. There was a silence for a minute and then the man said, Look champ, I don't know just how to give you this, but that money's all yours if you let Garcia put you down in three rounds. Yes, that's what they meant, take a dive. Henry saw red. He thought of all of his friends along Central Avenue in Los Angeles, betting on him and counting on him, and he just really got mad. He said, I wouldn't do that for a million, he shouted. I'm fighting Garcia on the level, as hard as I know how. If he wins, he'll have to knock me out. They started to reason with him. Uh, he just wasn't reasoning with at all. Uh, wasn't buying any of it. He told him to shut up and get out. That's what he told him. And he said, if you try it again, I'll call the FBI. And they got out. And they never approached him again. Or he's never approached ever again for a bribe. Eddie Meade wasn't taking the Filipino, which was obviously Garcia coming up. He wasn't taking him for granted. He wasn't taking him lightly at all. And he said to the press that Garcia hit so hard that he will have a chance against anybody as long as he is able to climb into the ring. Meade continued to say that bowler punch of his which is nothing more than a dressed-up right-hand uppercut, is a killer. When Henry fought him in New York, Garcia caught him at the back of the year with the bolo in the 12th round and Henry started dropping. He managed to come out of it before falling, but he wouldn't have had that punch caught him on the chin. Garcia will stiffen anybody he hits squarely. Well, the journalists, they were split on their predictions. Some favoured the 32-year-old Garcia, who had got better with age and was more comfortable at the weight, coming in at 153 and a half pounds. Others preferred the relentless pressure that the 142 pounder Henry Armstrong would bring, even though his punch output was beginning to dwindle, yet still a better volume than most. How much Henry actually weighed is difficult to assess because he wore a water soaked towel around his waist and two lead weights taped to his hips. Neither were anywhere near the £160 middleweight limit, but the £12 advantage for the Filipino made him the 8-5 to favourite. The Gilmore Stadium in Los Angeles held a capacity of 18,000, but an extra couple of thousand managed to cram into the arena in hope of witnessing boxing history, with Henry Armstrong attempting to be crowned the first to win world titles in four different weight classes. The middleweight champ, was in confident mood before the fight when he said, I'll nail him on the right spot before the fight is over, and when I do, he'll know he's been hit. I've found out he can't hurt me. He's a tough fellow to tag because he's always in motion, but don't think he can't be hit. I know Armstrong can take it, but you can only take so much. Well, Garcia continued and he said that he isn't going to keep me off balance for any 10 rounds, even if he throws 500 punches around. I know a lot more than I did a year ago. Well, the fight that had already been postponed for a few days because Garcia had actually suffered a burn in training from one of the ropes, apparently. And that was actually being thrown into jeopardy as well. And writer for the United Press, Henry McLemore, uh, raised the point that didn't seem to be bothering anyone else, but he raised a very good point, And it was that someone whose taste in literature is bad was reading the book on California state boxing rules the other day and came across this information informative and superbly written paragraph and it read so each contestant shall wear during each contest gloves wearing not less than five ounces if such contest weighs in ring attire 145 pounds or less and in six ounce gloves, if contestant weighs more than 145 pounds. Now, there was uproar about this from the Garcia camp, especially because of the amount of punches that Henry throws in a fight. They felt that he would now have the advantage, even though their 
man had a clear weight advantage. So what it meant is Garcia's going to be have he'll have the six ounces and obviously Henry would have the five because it was in the rules. It was mentioned that the commission would intervene on this rule, but nothing was ever confirmed. However, looking at the images, Henry certainly looks to be wearing five ounce gloves and Garcia's six. You can see there's a difference that, you know, Garcia's gloves are slightly bigger than his. Now, to explain how the fight went, though, the fight went down, we're going to use a report that was printed in Henry Armstrong's autobiography, which summed up what most ringsiders thought. And that was that Armstrong had done more than enough to win this fight, but he was robbed of a ma another magical moment in boxing history. And the report read that Garcia didn't win by knockout. It was a wild swinging fight for 10 rounds, but neither man went down. Henry was sure he would get the decision. He was dumbfounded when the referee left the ring without casting a vote. The referee just said it was too close. The report continued to describe that the referee took two rounds from Henry and what he said were fouls. Nobody else thought so. The press booed the decision and so did the fans. But Henry didn't get the title. He still thinks he was robbed and so did a lot of others. After the fight was concluded, a discussion went on in the press room with the Oakland Tribune where sports editor Art Cohn was listening to Jimmy Duffy, the Bay City's only boxing referee. Duffy was saying... According to all the newspaper reports, Blake admitted that he penalised Armstrong heavily for illegal tactics and took the fifth round away from him because of low blows. Obviously, California's number one referee is so damn good that he doesn't have to obey to California's boxing rules, but he can make his own. Meaning what, Cohen asked? Meaning this, snapped off it. There is no California boxing rule that permits a referee to penalise a fighter for a foul by taking the round away from him. The rules provide that we must warn him for illegal tactics, can disqualify him and stop the bout for repeated violations and even recommend fines after the bout. But we cannot punish him by awarding the round to his opponent. The question was, had the gamblers who couldn't get Henry to take a dive got to the referee, George Blake. Well, nothing would surprise us, of course. Now, after the disappointment of not securing a fourth world title in four separate weight classes, Henry then reeled off three knockout defences of his welterweight crown in a three-month period, April, May and June, during which time the United Press reported from Boston on May 25th, 1940 that world welterweight champion Henry Armstrong had earned nearly $700,000 in eight years of professional boxing. On the same day, Mike Jacobs announced that Henry Armstrong would meet Lou Jenkins, the newly crowned lightweight champion, after he knocked out Lou Ambers in Madison Square Garden. So the Armstrong-Jenkins fight was scheduled in for July 17, 1940 at the Polo Grounds in New York. The weight arrangements were that both fighters would scale 138 pounds to make sure that it wouldn't jeopardise Jenkins' crown, the lightweight crown. So before the fight, Armstrong said that I still believe the same general ideas and that's to keep them off balance. They have to be set to nail you hard and I try to keep them from getting set. No fighter off balance is going to hurt you much. I know how hard Jenkins can hit, but if you can keep on crowding in and never stop, they can't take aim and let you have it. So as his uh, ideology there from Henry himself, and Sid Fadar of the Valley Morning Star explained what happened just before the fight. And he said, Unbeknown to the 23,306 fight fans eagerly waiting for the fight to begin, there was drama backstage. And it looked as though there wasn't going to be a fight at all. Not in the ring anyway. Eddie Meade was threatening to call the fight off if any changes were made to the bandages on Armstrong's wrists. Meade and Kaplan had agreed two days before the fight to use 10 foot of bandage on each hand of their fighter. But a commission inspector watched the men with their bandages put on and promptly turned his thumbs down. The commission rules called for a seven and a half foot on each hand. He wouldn't allow the 10 yards and informed chairman John J. Phelan, who ordered the fight, off. Okay, Eddie Mee counted. 
then there would be no fight. And feeling all the promoter Mike Jacobs to announce the fight was off. Announce it yourself, grumbled Mike. You're stopping it. So and as yourself, the general returned to the ringside seat and gave it a second thought. He then picked up his special ringside phone, called the dressing rooms and told the inspectors to let Armstrong's bandages alone and let Jenkins use the same amount. End of fight on. Harry Ferguson wrote this in-depth piece on the fight and he said, Jenkins started fast, rights and left, rattled off Armstrong's head, a savage right uppercut set him back on his heels. In came Armstrong, bobbing, weaving, crouching and throwing those short vicious hooks to the head that stunned Jenkins into a coma and made him a sleepwalker under the hot lights. In the second round too, Jenkins slammed his right and his left to the head and won the round. Jenkins hit the floor first in the fourth round when Armstrong got him against the ropes and sent sledgehammer rights and lefts to the head. Lou got up at the count of nine and weathered the round, but worse trouble was ahead in the fifth. He came out fighting, but the hurricane again blew him down with rights and lefts to the head. Jenkins was up at the count of one and immediately was pounded to the canvas again. This time he stayed down until the count of nine and then got up to be saved by the bell. They worked hard over Jenkins between rounds, but when they sent him out, but when they sent him out for the six, the storm warnings were up and the hurricane was in full force. Armstrong bobbed in for the kill. Hooks to the head dropped Jenkins, but he got up at the count of one. Armstrong slugged him again and once more the Texas Gamecock hit the deck. But this time he stayed down for a nine count. When he got up, his legs were gone. His arms were dead. His brain was numb but his heart said go on. So he stood there while Armstrong floored him once more for a count of nine. The merciful clang of the bell then sent Jenkins to his corner, wobbling like a longshoreman on a Saturday night. Harry Ferguson continued, he said, he, Jenkins, sat down, then pitched off his stall. That was enough for everybody, including referee Donovan. Henry Armstrong blew his man down at the polo grounds last night in a bout that proved nothing except... The little man from Los Angeles is pound for pound one of the greatest fighters of all time. If we didn't already know that, I mean, wow. A glowing reference from Harry Ferguson. However, many felt that Henry was now showing the effects of a long career and was now on the decline. And Wilbur Wood of the New York Sun wrote that Henry Armstrong isn't half the fighter he used to be. And Lou Jenkins isn't half the fighter he was supposed to be. So even his manager, Eddie Mead, actually said in the dressing room, it was the worst fight I ever saw Henry fight. The Armstrong of two years ago would have run Jenkins right on past El Paso in round one. So moving on from the Jenkins fight, Armstrong had another fight against a guy called Phil Fur, and sitting ringside was a gentleman called Lewis F. Etchson, who reported on Henry's 19th defence of that welterweight title and that retirement was also on his mind. He said that Armstrong may have gone back some in a year, but you couldn't prove it by the 15,000 fans who saw him beat a rumba on Phil Fur's tattooed torso and finally knock him out in the fourth of a scheduled 15-round bout last night at the Griffith Stadium. There's plenty of steam in the old boilers still, and the welterweight champion intends to keep up the pressure until Christmas or a month or so after, or thereafter, then hang the mahogany mittens on some handy now at, as a keepsake. He would like to quit after boxing in the annual Christmas fun card in Cleveland, but the alluring prospect of a good money shot may keep him on the treadmill until spring. After that, he's through, definitely, so he says. Henry's 20th defence came against the rough and rugged Fritzy Zivic. Armstrong had already beaten one of the Zivic brothers two years ago. The manager of all five of the brothers, Luke Carney, remembered that Eddie Zivic never had an opportunity to fight for a title. Armstrong knocked him out in the fourth round in 1938 and Fritzy is out to avenge his brother's loss. Henry might as well know here and now that we're going to win next Friday. The International News wrote on the fight at Madison Square Garden on October 4th, 1940. For the first seven rounds, they stood head-to-head 
with Henry banging away from the outside and Fritzy stabbing, cutting and slashing at Henry's eyes. Henry was on his way out as early as the eighth round when Zivik, fighting a cool, heady battle, cut both of the fading champion's eyes and never let up banging away at them. Joseph C. Nichols wrote what happened next and wrote, in the 11th round, the defending title holder was blind to all intents and purposes. As he returned to his corner at the end of each round, he would murmur prayfully, Oh, if I could only see. Jack Cuddy, a writer in California, confirmed, bleeding from gashes above both eyes, from his left cheek, from mouth and nose, Hurricane Hank explained later in the dressing room that he could not see out of his left eye after the third round and that he was virtually blinded in both eyes after the tenth with blood from his brows. Pat Robinson was ringside for the International News Service and he wrote this on the last round of the fight. Henry answered the bell for the 15th round with a wild rush, almost sweeping Zivik off his feet. But Zivik backed away, slashing and cutting. And just as the bell was about to ring for the end of the fight, he landed a hard right on Henry's jaw and the champ went headlong to the canvas. The first time he had been knocked down in his championship career. The bell saved him from the count. His seconds ran out and dragged him back to his corner. The result was a close but conclusive victory for Fritzy Zivic, as Henry Armstrong lost the last of his world titles by unanimous decision. The new world king, Fritzy Zivic, said after that Armstrong hit surprisingly hard, but those bolo punches hurt more than any of his punches hurt me. Every time I landed one of them, I had noticed that right away his punches lost steam. He's the gamest guy I ever saw. Pat Robinson then gave a glowing reference to Armstrong in his report, stating that there are some sports events so unforgettably thrilling, they remain etched in the memory forever. Jack Dempsey being knocked out of the ring by Lewis Furpo. Mano War racing JP Greera to defeat in the stretch. Babe Ruth calling his shot in the World Series. Old Pete Alexander shuffling into fan Tony Lazieri with the bases loaded. Glenn Cunningham breaking a world record. All memories that linger, but none of them more so stirring than the sight of a little Henry Armstrong, battered, bruised and blinded, marching into the doom against the flying vist of Fritzy Zebik in Madison Square Garden last night. Yes, Henry lost his welterweight title after 15 of the most vicious rounds ever fought, but he lost it like a true champion should. Well, Alan Ward of the Oakland Tribune didn't hold back on his assessment of where Henry was now in this unbelievable career of his, and he wrote, Let others more maudlin than I bemoan the sad fate which has fallen the greatest prize fighter of his generation, Henry Armstrong. Let others weep, figuratively. Tears that a rank outsider not only won Henry's welterweight championship, but gave hammering Hank a whipping from which he will probably never recover. For my part, I'm inclined to say goody goody and express the fervent hope that Armstrong has learnt his lesson and will retire with his annuities and the bosom of his family and leave prize fighting for younger but not more courageous men. And in saying this, I am prompted by a deep admiration and friendship for Henry Armstrong. I knew Armstrong when he was a hollow-cheeked lad who wore cast-off clothes and didn't eat regularly. He'd fight for peanuts here and in other parts of California, and even then he was the same stout-hearted little gentleman he is today. Success hasn't spoilt Henry. He's well in the chips, and able to have pork chops seven days a week if he so minds. He can afford to buy half a dozen tailor-made suits at a crack and 20 neckties. But good food and fancy duds can't be completely enjoyed by a man young in years, if old in ring experience, whose brain is foggy, who bounces when he walks and whose eyes can't properly focus. Oh, Armstrong isn't in any such condition at, at present, but he is quite apt to be if he absorbs one or two more lacings like the one handed to him Friday night in New York. Come on, Henry, be a smart chap and quit while you're still right up there at the top of the heap. Others, 
while they were not so sure it was time for Henry to hang them up yet. Jack Cuddy wrote this for the United Press. He said, They'll drive nails in your coffin more quickly in boxing than in any other sport. One losing fight and you're a bum. You're washed up. He then went on to say that Henry Armstrong got licked Friday night by Fritzy Zivic in such a fashion that they took away the last of Armstrong's titles, the welterweight crown. It was a just decision. There's no question about that. We are predicting now that Armstrong will knock out Zivic within 10 rounds of a return melee. We know that Armstrong still has at least one good fight in his body and that he will return in that fight, which is scheduled, which is January 17th, after a three and a half month rest. Henry Armstrong needed rest. I mean, he's so active, it's unbelievable. And two eye operations uh, before he could even start getting himself ready for a rematch in the new year. Now, while at the Hot Springs training camp in Arkansas, Henry was a month away from his 28th birthday and he declared he would retire sooner rather than later. He said, that's definite. I'm not fooling myself. I'm coming like old black Joe slow. May not get there at all. We get we get old C and you get cut up. So he's, he's looking at retiring at this point after this rematch. And in December, Henry Armstrong was handed a prestigious award ahead of Joe Lewis and Max Bear. As reported by Sid Fidar, uh, he wrote, For his contribution to boxing in losing as well as winning, Henry Armstrong on Tuesday was awarded the Edward J. Neal Memorial Trophy, which annually on, honours the memory of the Associated Press boxing writer and war correspondent who was killed in Spain. In naming Armstrong unanimously, the New York Boxing Writers Association considered his gallant showing in losing his worldweight championship to Fritzy Zivic two months ago, as much as the fact he is the only man in the ring in fistic history to hold three world titles simultaneously. So after picking out that award, he decided that the immediate rematch against Fritzy Zivic was a risk that he believed that was worth taking. He wrote in his autobiography that the defeat he had handed by Zivic hurt Henry's heart more than his eyes, apparently. He could not and would not admit that he was through, even though he was aware of the fact that his reflexes were not what they used to be, that he didn't seem to be able to punch as hard as he had a year ago, that his timing was off and that his legs had got tired too fast. He was still sure he could take Zivic. Something else was rankling in his heart too. More and more he kept thinking about preaching. That voice from somewhere beyond kept coming back. It was aggravating like a little splinter under your fingernail, it wouldn't let him alone. Nobody was putting any pressure on him about this. Nobody but that insistent, tireless voice from somewhere. He trained hard for Zivic. This was it. When he climbed into the ring at Madison Square Garden on the night, January 17th, 1941, he looked out on the biggest fight crowd in the history of the garden. Mike Jacobs had even sold standing there were over 23,000 in the seats and in the aisles, and rumour had it that 10,000 were milling around in the streets outside. It was an Armstrong crowd. Here were his friends, his old fans, his pals from Harlem, come to cheer the old warrior. They had bet 8-5 to five on him to win. It almost made him cry. Well, most expected Henry to get the job done, after a three-month rest and two eye operations, many of the sports writers were calling him New Henry Armstrong. But Zivic would prove them all wrong, again. So we're going to go into the fight details, and one reporter explained how Zivic took command in the first round and kept it by waging a crafty battle. The best weapon in his arsenal was one of the fanciest uppercuts ever seen hereabouts. And that uppercut tore Armstrong's face to shreds, rocked his brain and reeled his senses until referee Arthur Donovan stepped in after 33 minutes and 52 seconds of fighting. Joe Williams explained that referee Arthur Donovan had gone over to Armstrong's corner at the end of the 10th round to scrutinise the condition of his bleeding and lacerated eyes. It was the third such trip the referee had made. Completing his 
examination this time, the referee said one more round, Henry. If you can't do it in one more, I'll have to stop it. The fighter nodded his head and tapped his heels on his gloves together impatiently. It was a round that will long be remembered by the thousands who thronged the garden. And with both eyes closing and his, and his face a bloody smear, Armstrong for the first time during the fight was the old Armstrong, a human dynamo, moving relentlessly forward, throwing punches in a steady stream, angry, desperate streams, fighting his heart out. For a full two minutes, he was strangely young and vibrant again, a pulse-beating picture of the youngster who came here years ago to amaze ringsiders with his inexhaustible stamina and insolent indifference to punishment. However, it wasn't enough. James P. Douglas of the New York Times also recalled that those two minutes were glorious and spectacular while it lasted. However, Zivic then stepped to the attack and through the last minute of the 11th round as he hammered and punched Armstrong mercilessly with a short chopping but stinging lefts and rights that ripped open old wounds and started a flow of blood. Examined by the doctor between rounds, Henry was allowed to continue and he started the 12th as if to press his dynamic recovery. But he had given all of his strength in that 11th strand. Hammering Henry shuffled into a barrage of straight lefts, a crisscross fire of lefts and rights, punishing, cutting blows. He tried a roundhouse right for the jaw, missed and slipped. Up he came facing his foe, charging recklessly, only to be pelted by Zivik's shower of blows. When Donovan realised what Armstrong must have known but would not admit, the referee stepped between the fighters and waved an end to the battle and Armstrong's career. When the fighters left the ring, the cheers for Henry were louder than those for Zivik. The crowd was still with him, even in defeat. Dr Alexander Schiff, who examined Armstrong after the fight, said the cuts around his eyes would not endanger his sight. Just before they left the dressing room, Zivik came in. He took Henry's hand and said slowly, Henry, you're the greatest champ that ever lived. The final moments of the night were explained in Henry's autobiography, and it reads, Then the lights were out in the garden, and the place was still. Henry missed one familiar figure in his corner that night. Eddie Mead wasn't there. Eddie had had a heart attack, and on doctor's orders, he had listened to the fight over the radio. In Dr Schiff's office, Henry found Eddie stretched out on a couch, his eyes filled with tears. He reached out and took Henry's hand, and he said slowly, It's all over, Hank. We'll never have to go through with anything like this again. You go home now, to California, and get a good long rest with your family and your friends. You've earned it, boy. Then Dr Schiff came in and led Henry over to the operating table, where he began to cut away the scar tissue that had been building up around the eyes and to stitch the bleeding eyes and mouth. Well, Armstrong took home $16,500 for that brutal night's work, which added to his career earnings of apparently and approximately $350,000. A nice nest egg for the legendary fighter who then announced his retirement, although temporarily after the bout. How and why Henry Armstrong returned to the ring was explained also in his autobiography. So it was 16 months before fight fans saw him back in a professional ring again. And it was a woman who talked him into it. So her name was Emma Lou Jackson, his sister-in-law, who had been a constant in Henry's corner ever since he came home with a black eye and a broken nose as a kid fighter trying to break into boxing. So Henry, after retirement, he cashed in, so this is from his autobiography, so he cashed in some bonds and bought himself a beautiful new Cadillac and started for home early in February. First things first, he had to go to St. Louis and say goodbye to Sis Lou. He found her reading her Bible by the light with three light candles and she was delighted to see him. Emma Lou was religious uh, from her head to her toes. She spoke to Henry before he could speak. Come on, 
Come on in, brother. I've been waiting for you. And I've got news, great news for you. Right now, you think you're through. But you're not. You are going back to the ring and you'll make more money than ever. And we couldn't believe, couldn't believe what she was saying. Dr. Schiff had warned him never to fight again. That if he did, his eyes would be cut to ribbons and he'd be blind. Emily laughed. Don't believe it, brother. You just go on out to California like he said and rest yourself. And trust God, he's a great healer. In three months, he'll make you good as new. I know he told me so. Just put the thought of getting her out of your mind. It won't happen. You'll make a comeback. And in all the fights you have in the comeback, you'll never get a scratch. God said so. Why don't you listen to him, Henry? Why didn't he listen? The voice, again. They stood there looking wistfully at the little glimmering candles and a little candle began to glimmer, to flicker and grow brighter in the heart of Henry Armstrong. Back in California, he rested a while. He checked his assets. Not so good. He would have to do something. Now Joe Glazer was in the music business and he got him some work with Don Redmond's orchestra in Detroit telling Henry he could make a lot of money. It wasn't for Henry. He quit after two weeks, borrowed on some life insurance grants and went home. Lee Lewis, a famous publicity man, got Henry back in the ring, refereeing fights up and down the West Coast. It lasted seven months and he was off home again. Movie tough guy George Raft had the ex-champ touring army camps, staging exhibitions for the soldiers. This was more like it. He was getting back in the ring, getting into condition, and it meant doing something for the boys in the army. Just after the Barney Ross fight in 1938, Eddie Meade had introduced his boy to Freddie Somers, who sent Henry out with a softball team, booking him all over the country. When that flopped, Freddie had another idea. What about a comeback? Have a few warm-up fights, then go after some big names? This was more like what Henry had in mind. But in May of 1942, Henry was saddened by the news that Eddie Meade had died of a heart attack at the age of 49. A Texas newspaper wrote that, in Los Angeles, May 27th, 5,000 fight fans stood silent as the timer's bell sounded ten times in memory of Eddie Meade, who piloted Henry Armstrong to three world championships. And standing in the centre of the ring was Armstrong, who came to the Olympic Auditorium last night to see George Latka, lightweight, outbox Richie Lemos. It was in the same ring that Meade and Armstrong began their fistic association several years ago. Well, Henry, of course, was distraught when he lost his manager and good friend, Eddie Meade. But if he wanted to get back into the boxing ring, he needed a new manager. And the guy he chose was a knowledgeable man called George Moore, who knew his way about the business of boxing. Henry was back in the ring on June 1st, 1942 in San Jose against Johnny Taylor. Now, even though he had been out of the ring for a year and a half, he stopped the average welterweight in four rounds. Johnny Taylor, after the fight, said, I've been fighting 12 years under 18 different names, and that's the first cauliflower ear I ever got. I still can't get over it. The great Armstrong slugging me, whacking me for three heats without knocking me down. And all he gets is $470, which he has to cut with his manager. But what the hell? I didn't even get $200. We're both washed up. The only difference between us is I know it. Well, Henry was not interested on winning any titles, apparently. At this point, he was fighting to earn just money. He told column, columnist Stubby Currents, I really am not interested in getting to the top again for a big Eastern fight. I'll be satisfied to fight a lot of boys out this way and pick up what I can. The money I make this time will be used more wisely. But after taking a points decision in his second comeback fight, he actually lost a decision two weeks late, later to Ruben Shank. The local paper wrote, At the Municipal Auditorium in Denver, the best welterweight prospect in the Rockies took all Henry had to offer in the sixth round 
bounced off the floor after a nine count and finished fast to win a unanimous decision. This comeback stuff isn't so easy, muttered Henry, but I thought I had him. So did the sports writers at ringside who marked their cards in favour of hammering Hank by a wide margin. Armstrong said he would like to meet Shank in a neutral city and thought the decision hurt Shank's reputation. After being awarded the decision by referee Max Bayer in the Jackie Burke fight, the Moline Daily Dispatch reported that Armstrong said he hoped to land a title fight with Fred Red Cochran, the welterweight champion. Earlier in the week, he denied title aspirations and declared he was fighting just for the fun of it and to keep him trim. Burke didn't find it fun after picking himself up off the floor five times, but he managed to survive until the end. Even George Moore was confident about his fighter when he said afterwards, I say again, hammering Hank is the next welterweight champion. William Smiley of the Ogden Standard Examiner understood why Henry was still fighting when he wrote about how he had lost his wealth. He said a couple of weeks later, the almost ring legend took a close look at his bank book. It didn't look too good. Bad investments had cut into it. There had been a Chinese restaurant in Hollywood in which Henry invested $7,000. It went bad. All Henry got out of it was one good Philip McGowan steak. Discouraged, he and Eddie then got into a motion picture deal. Henry was the hero of the film, which was shot in Long Island City. It was called Keep Punching, but it was certainly no knockout. It carried on to say that Henry is still punching, trying to get back to what he put into that one. How much he put in, he'll never know. He thought of these flops and of the other ex-champs who had gone into business to safeguard their winnings. Some had done well, Jack Dempsey, Harry Wills, Jimmy McClellan, for instance. But then there was also Sam Langford, who died destitute and blind. George Godfrey, the Black Shadow, who died in a shack in Los Angeles. And Ad Walgus, who actually died in a mental institution. You never know how you'll end up in this game. Henry still thought he'd come out, well, rich in the end. Henry felt like he was on his way to earning big money again and winning back some of those losses when he took home his highest purse to date since his return to the ring, which was 4,861. And that was the profit made for knocking out uh, Rodolfo Ramirez in eight rounds in Oakland. Since beginning his comeback in June of 1942, Henry Armstrong had won 10 of 11 fights, losing a hometown decision against that Ruben Shank in Denver. He said, I'm dead serious about the comeback and I'm confident that I can regain the world's welterweight and lightweight titles. I want to get Zivic and Cochrane in the ring. I'll beat them both. Well, the one fight Henry wanted more than any, any other fight was that return against Fritzy Zivic, who in the last 22 months since taking on Armstrong and taking his welterweight title from him, had lost seven of 27 bouts, including the loss of his that welterweight title just six months after taking it from Henry Armstrong, which was against Freddie Red Cochran, who pulled off a massive upset in New Jersey, which was Zivic's backyard. Now, talking to columnist John Lardner, the ex-champ was thinking nothing less than victory, the ex-champ being, of course, Henry Armstrong. He said he was just a nasty fighter, just a foul fighter. He did everything foul, and of course, when he got me, he got me when I was tired, and I should have been resting, but my manager wanted that money quick. When he fought Lou Jenkins, Civic showed that punches in the body can hurt him. He winced every time Jenkins hit him in the middle. Well now, I can hit much harder in the body than Jenkins, and I can hit five times as often. Along about the time Zivic figures he will start getting the range on my face, I will have him so hurt and discouraged he won't feel like lifting his hands. What I aim to do is keep Zivic so busy protecting himself that he won't have time to work on me. Well, the fight was arranged, and it was held at the Civic Auditorium in San Francisco on October 26, 1942. The United Press reported, Henry Armstrong, Los Angeles, who once held three world titles, has avenged the defeat which forced him into retirement two years ago with the decision over Fritzy Zivic of Pittsburgh.
12,000 fans paid more than $30,000 last night to watch Armstrong pound out a decisive 10-round decision over his favoured opponent in the Civic Auditorium. Both were cautious in the first round, but Armstrong brought the crowd up cheering in the second with a two-fisted attack to Civic's head. He continued the onslaught in the next round. Civic rallied to take the fourth and seemed to tire fast. Although there were no knockdowns, Henry landed a continuous barrage of rights and lefts to Fritzy's head throughout the bout and twice had Civic staggering. The unanimous decision for Armstrong was enough to rekindle his hopes and the hopes of his backers that he would reach the top again. Henry said afterwards, I gave him a good beating. I didn't try to knock him out. I just wanted to punish him. Well, from New York, Jack Mahone noted, the boys on Jacob's Beach were talking about little Henry Armstrong, the human perpetual motion machine, which slowed down for more than a year, but is now working on all cylinders again. Little Henry licked Fritzy Zivik out in San Francisco the other night, and now he's coming back to the beach. The little dynamo should be backed here late in December and will provide a real Christmas sock for promoter Mike Jacobs, who has just about abandoned all belief in Santa Claus. Mike hopes to stage a fourth Armstrong and Zivic battle in Madison Square Garden in early January, and if the former free crown kid wins, that one will put him in against the sensational Ray Robinson, the unbeaten Harlem welterweight. Now, Archie Moore's manager, Charlie Johnston, told the others, um, the other Jacob Beach members, that all this talk of a comeback was silly. Armstrong isn't coming back, he said. He said he's back. He was, but the welterweight title was now off limits due to Red Cochran being in the Navy in the war effort, and therefore his title was frozen until he could return. The only logical title challenge would have to be for the lightweight division. But to make the £135 limit now would be almost impossible for Henry. However, Henry and his manager, George Moore, claimed that he could make that weight in the press. So two months after that Zivic win, Armstrong was in the ring with Lou Jenkins, still fighting at the weight limit. The Thomas Times Enterprise reported on this fight held at Portland Auditorium. He said that Henry Armstrong, the tireless little boxer from Los Angeles, knocked ex-lightweight champion Lou Jenkins out of his way last night. Henry punched the Sweetwater, Texas boy to the canvas eight times before referee Tom Lutit stopped the one-sided fray and awarded Armstrong a technical knockout in the eighth round. The two former ring rulers drew a 4,750 fans and the largest indoor gate in Portland ring history bringing in 16,892. Armstrong was clearly trying to get prepared for a lightweight title challenge as he dropped from £144 in his next fight to £140 in the other and then £137.5 in the third. He won the first by knockout, the second he outpointed Jimmy McDaniels and lost the third by a majority decision against Willie Joyce. An operation to have his tonsils removed between the McDaniels and Joyce fights were reported as the reason for his defeat, stating that it may have weakened him and taken the sting out of his punches. That being said, Henry still managed to break the jaw of Joyce during the fight, but lost a narrow but convincing decision. He said afterwards, I lost the fight all right. I was rusty and missed a lot of punches. Joyce was awfully fast and I just couldn't seem to nail him down. I'd sure like to fight him again, and soon. Armstrong was able to regain some prestige to atone for the defeat by Willie Joyce at Los Angeles a week later with a second round stoppage of Tippi Larkin in San Francisco. Two weeks later, on March 22, 1943, Henry was back in action in Philadelphia. The Fort Madison Evening Democrat praised his performance by writing, The experts were forced to admit generally, that the Armstrong of today is a better fighter than the semi-blinded gladiator who was stopped by Zivic. The experts had read of Armstrong's 17 comeback fights on the Pacific coast, but they took those accounts with a grain of aspirin. Hence the miracle of Armstrong last night, a guy who was much more impressive at 30 than he had been at 28. Armstrong 
was impressive last night, though forced to the full 10 rounds by the 22-year-old Chibwane, who fought an inspired fight and absorbed unceasing punishment because he simply wouldn't go down. Yeah, and even the former lightweight contender, Lou Tenla, was impressed. He remarked after witnessing his performance at first hand, how Armstrong kept up that pace, I don't know. He's still doing it. And with Armstrong's next opponent already arranged against the New York State Athletic Commission lightweight champion, and that was, of course, the superb Bo Jack. Many experts who thought we had a chance against Jack at New York on April 4, wrote instead that Jack, Bojack, will be lucky to last a distance against him. Incredible. So all of a sudden, it's tipped in his favour. Even the great Benny Leonard, who had witnessed Henry Armstrong in training at first hand, made a very bold statement. He said, I'm going to surprise you with my prediction on Friday night's fight. I pick Armstrong to lick Bojack. Armstrong at 30 is still an unusual athlete physically and one of the smartest boxers I've ever seen. He knows too much for Bo Jack and he still has the body to put that knowledge into operation. He never was given enough recognition for his cleverness. Then had emphasised that Henry Armstrong is a brilliant fighter, in his words, a brilliant fighter of the Jack Dempsey type, he said. Benny also said that Armstrong is a bobber and a weaver also. But he has a certain jungle rhythm in his attack that I've never seen in anyone else. His rhythm permits him to maintain a terrific pace from gong to gong. The most killing pace I believe the ring has known. Writer Jack Cuddy of the Hammond Times gave insight into Henry and Bo Jack's history between each other. And he said that Armstrong actually taught his style and rhythm to Bo Jack before Bo even had a professional fight. That was when Armstrong was training for his second fight with Zivic, just before he went into retirement. But Bojack hasn't had time to yet to master the things Armstrong taught him. Perhaps he never will. That's what Jack Cuddy said. However, Jack Bojack, 22 years of age, the lightweight holder, still went into the fight as a favourite. Bojack's title was not at stake because it was only a 10-rounder and as we've said before, the state only acknowledged 15 rounds when their title is on the line. Henry Armstrong, the teacher, took on his pupil and close friend Bojack on April 2nd, 1943 at Madison Square Garden, his first visit to the legendary arena since the second Zivic defeat. Promoter Mike Jacobs earned a record-breaking crowd of 19,986 and took $146,976 from the gate. Associated Press had Sid Federe at ringside writing and he wrote, It is very fortunate for Bojack that the number of bicycles for domestic consumption was increased this week because if the jumping jack didn't have his two-wheeler with the reverse motion, he probably wouldn't hold a decision over Henry Armstrong today. The jumping jack climbed on his velocipede in Madison Square Garden's ring last night and backpedalled furiously for 10 rounds. And at the end, two judges and the referee gave him the verdict over the hammer, who chased him so much, the thing began to look like a six-day bike race. The decision was booed by most in attendance. Jack Cuddy humorously wrote, Before the bout, some observers questioned Armstrong's sight. Afterwards, those sceptics questioned the sight of the officials. Bo said himself after the fight, the man I didn't want to box at all was my idol, Henry Armstrong. But when he said, Bo, our friendship ceases when we go into the ring, I told my manager, I'll take the fight then. The greatest fighter that ever lived as far as I'm concerned. He's a fine man. It's hard enough to win one title and this man got three. In your mind, it comes to you. What must I do? I was lucky enough to beat him. Yeah, and Bojack continued, he said, but if I had to go back over the fight with him again, good as I love to fight, I don't think that I'd want to do it. I don't think I'd want to go back over it again. Well, Henry, in his dressing room after the fight, said, I know in my heart that I gave Bojack everything I had and I feel sure he, he was all out to flatter me if he could. 
And I want to tell my friends in St. Louis that if I ever won a fight in my life, it was that one with Bo Jack. And then Armstrong then actually complimented his uh, pupil, Bo, while at the same time he sort of discredited his punching power. He said he's a good boy, tremendously improved since I last saw him before my retirement, and he's strictly a top notcher. He then said, frankly, I expected him to be a harder puncher. Uh, he didn't hurt me one bit, but he lost. So each fire actually received just shy of $25,000 each, which is not a bad payday at all. I think it's his biggest amount since his return. A rematch was squashed quite simply because Bo Jack decided he didn't want to fight his, his trainer, his teacher and his good friend again. Uh, Armstrong wanted it, but he didn't. Both men moved on with their careers. Henry won his next three by knockout in the space of two months before being matched against Sammy Agnon at the Garden again. Armstrong took a rightful decision in this fight on the cards but suffered severe cuts again to his lower lip that actually required nine stitches in the process, meaning he needed a couple of months out of the ring. And Henry knew he was coming to the end of his career. He actually explained at this moment in time, all in all, I'd say... I'll have a dozen more fights at the most before the end of the year. I'm 32 now, and I've been fighting a dozen years. None of us last forever. However, I can round out this year and then call it a career. On his return in the summer of 1943, Henry took three decision victories before he was matched with the brilliant Sugar Ray Robinson at Madison Square Garden, which many reported as a complete mismatch. At this point, it was only about the money. There was no way an ageing Armstrong stood a chance against a 22-year-old welterweight champion in waiting. Before the fight, Sugar Ray was asked by Hype Igor of the New York Journal American if he would be able to hurt Armstrong, who was someone he obviously admired. Robinson's manager, George Gainford, interrupted his tone sharply and said, You remember his first Golden Gloves final, Hype? You remember how he knocked down that spider valentine boy? They were pals for years. Shot marbles together. Did everything together. But that didn't stop Robinson from knocking him down. No room in this business for friendship hype. Now into the fight itself, which we spoke of in Sugar Ray Robinson's career profile, and the reporter, Whitney Martin, observed, most of the crowd present had the idea that Ray Robinson was spilling a little of the milk of human kindness in his bout with Henry Armstrong at Madison Square Garden last Friday night. That is, that out of sympathy and respect he refrained from knocking out the worn and weary warrior. If such was the case, it was history making ditto marks with Armstrong drawing the interest on a little investment in chivalry on his part. It wasn't too many years before that Armstrong then at his peak had met a fading Barney Ross. Those who saw that battle memorable because of the refusal of Ross to quit when hopelessly beaten, carried away the vivid impression that Armstrong eased up in the late rounds out of tribute to his gallant opponent, who was determined to go out as a champion should go out, doing his best and asking no quarter. Those who saw that battle also probably never imagined that someday a few years away, this same Armstrong would be in a position similar to that of Ross, saved from a knockout by the compassion of a younger and stronger rival. It's, it's how it happens. It always happens this way. The crowd, keen on the kill, didn't actually like Robinson's caution and actually booed him loudly. Ray Robinson afterwards said that Armstrong was the greatest I ever fought and I never could get him in trouble. Armstrong said afterwards that he was dazed by Robinson's first left, but after that, I got into it and it didn't bother me. I knew it looked bad, uh, referring to the booing at the end of the fight from the third round on. It's it's my style of fighting. If Robinson had come in instead of staying away, it would have been different. Ray just wouldn't fight. He told me he was going to run. I, al I almost knocked him out in the third round. I say, Ray, this is the garden and they're booing. I've never been booed in the garden. So they must be booing you. Why don't you come in and fight? Apparently, Robinson turned around and said, to hell with you, Hank. I ain't going to get hit like that no more. If you catch me, catch me. 
I'm going to try and win this fight on a decision. Belief in some circles was that Henry Armstrong was twice retired, something that he said was untrue. Henry confirmed that he only ever had one comeback attempt, and that was after that Zivic defeat. So after losing to Ray Robinson in New York, he was inactive. He explained that he it was because he needed a long rest. Well, he was back in the ring just four months later. So following Henry's four-month layoff, he entered the ring in January 1944 and went on to stop Aldo Spaldi in the third round at the Auditorium in Portland. And this was the third time he stopped the Italian in a four-fight series. He decisioned him in the other Henry then declared he had his old faithful timing back and confidently predicted a victory for himself in a bout with the NBA lightweight champion, Sammy Angnot. He said, I'm still in there hammering. Henry then went on a 10-fight winning streak in the space of five months travelling up and down the country. Along the way, he stopped six and took five decisions before facing Willie Joyce in their third meeting at the Chicago Stadium on June 2nd, 1944. Armstrong had won their rematch before the Ray Robinson bout and was hoping to rubber stamp his domination over Joyce, even at this veteran stage of his career. However, Armstrong, who fought a relentless battle chasing Joyce all over the ring, throwing punches left, right and centre, often fell short and missed with wild punches, but he never gave up forcing the action. In the end, he lost another decision to Joyce, which was greeted with boos and cheers. Two weeks later, and Henry was ready for another fight against Al Bummy Davis in Madison Square Garden. He told the reporters before the fight, I don't know how long I'll be fighting. I feel swell now, sharp as a razor, after plenty of competition. I should lick Davis all right if I watch his left hook. I can't go on fighting forever, but I want to fight as long as I can store up a war chest. Well, Henry was now looking to the future and he actually decided to take on a young fighter from the Stillman's gym. He said that with the money he can bank before retiring, it will be spent, of course, on himself and banking that money, but also on developing his protege, his young protege. And that was young uh, Nuttall, young Nuttall. He said he was the most amazing youngster I ever saw. This Nuttall kid is only 13. He's still an amateur. But what he can do with his vist is absolutely unbelievable. So on a hot night in June, Henry showed the world that he was, or still had something to offer the boxing world. The Associated Press reported on the fight with Albami Davis. It said Henry Armstrong is still one of the best fighters in the business. The former triple champion demonstrated it last night by flattering Albami Davis in less than two rounds. The crowd screamed deafeningly as Hammering Hank battered the Brooklyn bad boy to the canvas four times, twice in the first round before referee Frank Fulham stopped it after 69 seconds of the second strata. Davis was actually stretched full length flat on his face when Fulham, without bothering to count, waved Armstrong to his corner. So after his third fight in June, three fights in June, another points victory, Henry was still optimistic about his future. He said... As long as I can win and make money out of the game, I like boxing and apparently the fans like me. I'm going to stay in the game until they quit paying to see me. When the gate receipts drop, then I'll know it's time to quit. On July 4th in Los Angeles, Henry Armstrong dropped a decision against John Thomas, who was a decade younger than Armstrong, but wouldn't have been fit to tie his shoelaces a few years ago, let alone beat the former triple champion. Yet Armstrong continued, even after the Thomas defeat. Ten days later after that, he drew with another fighter, Luther Slugger White in Hollywood. The following month, in August 1944, Henry drew his series of fights 2-2, with Willie Joyce taking a 10-round decision. It was wrote in his 1957 autobiography. Armstrong said he had money now, but there was a new idea about taxes. He had to pay out a lot of it in income tax. The Second World War was on and the war cost everybody money. Henry grumbled a little at giving Uncle Sam so much of his earnings, but he gave it. Who didn't? 19 fights in 1944, Henry won 16 of them. It looked good. Actually, it wasn't. By now, Henry knew that his number was up. 
The old speed was gone. He just couldn't make the big time anymore. He could fight the second raters, but the boys near the top were too much for him. He did get some satisfaction from knocking out Mike Beloy in Portland, Oregon, but he knew Mike had had it too. Henry fought three times in 1945 to close his career. In the Oakland Auditorium, he drew with Chester Slider on January the 17th. Then on February the 6th, he outpointed Gennaro Rojo at the Olympic Auditorium in Los Angeles. He then travelled back to Oakland for a rematch with Slider on Valentine's Day, losing a very contentious decision after knocking him down in the third round. The Oakland Tribune explained that referee Billy Burke claimed he lost his original scoring card when he was asked about awarding the decision to Slider, and he made up a scorecard from memory that had Slider ahead. The crowd booed the decision, and Armstrong's manager was upset. George Moore was so upset, he protested the decision, which was never overturned, but referee Burke was suspended from officiating by the California Boxing Commission. So later that year... When Henry was asked on how to improve the scoring process in boxing, uh, he actually made his voice heard on this terrible, unjust decision that he just spoke of. And he said, I've had some bad decisions against me, like that one against Chester Slider out in Oakland, where I beat him in every round and broke his leg and still lost the decision. I've often wondered how these things were ever scored. He was never offered to have this loss declared as a no contest even though everyone within the press had him winning this final fight of his career although Henry didn't know at the time this would be his final professional fight it was officially the end of his storied boxing career his boxing record varies depending on your sources but we're going to use the records provided by the Missouri Sports Hall of Fame and the International Boxing Hall of Fame which reads he had 181 bouts, he won 151, lost 21 and drew 9, with a total of 101 KOs. It may not have been official, but the great Henry Armstrong knew his time was up, and so did everyone else in the sport. This was evident when out of the blue, a Portland promoter, Joe Waterman, wrote an article. An article like none other that we've ever read of or spoken of in any of our career profiles and this is out read here is what i propose that all of us matchmakers and boxing promoters who have been made great whenever henry fought for us get together and give him a sort of testimonial banquet before he leaves for the overseas boxing tour or before he permanently retires from the ring most of us matchmakers on the coast and some in the east have been made great matchmakers the day after Armstrong fought for us. Joe Waterman was the greatest ever when Armstrong drew $18,000 and $16,000 with Lou Jenkins and Jimmy Garrison, respectively. The article continued to read, Henry has drawn an average of about $23,000 every time he fought in the Olympic in Los Angeles for Baby McCoy. Charlie McDonald's record for the Hollywood Legion Stadium was that Open air show with Armstrong Garcia drew $68,000. The same goes for Benny Ford, whose Armstrong Zivic and Armstrong Joyce fights drew $41,000 and $33,000 in San Francisco. Jimmy Mirre of Oakland, who really is about the best of us all, knows the Armstrong pull there. So I say, let us get together, Mirre, Ford, McDonald, McCoy, and Waterman, and give Henry a banquet as a testimonial to one of the greatest boxers who ever crushed resin in a ring. A testimonial to the fighter who makes great matchmakers of guys like Waterman and the rest. Well, they did indeed hold a dinner in Henry Armstrong's honour. One night in February of 1944 at the Hotel Lemington in Oakland, California. Joe Waterman addressed the dinner by saying, Actually, we're not here to honour Armstrong the great fighter. Armstrong the three-time champion of the world but Henry Armstrong, the man, the great American. Henry was overwhelmed with the praise he received, and he said affectionately, I don't belong to Oakland, yet Oakland friends have honoured me. I've won no title, but I've been greeted like a champion. It's mighty swell. I'll never forget it. I've had banquets, I've been handed bouquets, but honestly, none has been quite as nice as this. 
Sheriff Gleason presented Armstrong with a gold badge and named him an honorary deputy sheriff. A parchment and leather scroll bearing the names of all men present was given to him and the Oakland Boxing Group, Jimmy Murray, Ray Carlin, Tommy Simpson and Frank Tabor made him a custom-made luggage set. And Henry said, I'll be back in Oakland um, when he said his goodbyes to his well wishes. He said, but not until I return from one of the battlefronts, whether I fight here again or whether I just drop in to say hello, it's important, but I'll be back. And with that, Henry set off overseas. The call had come from Uncle Sam because the former triple champion was now needed to keep up morale of the troops at the war. So at the end of February, he put on his army uniform and went out to, with uh, Kenny Washington, the UCLA football star, Bill Yancey, a of basketball fame, and Joe Lillard, the New York cop and former drop kicking football star from Oregon State. They called themselves the Henry Armstrong Sport Unit Number Five Hundred. Apparently, so Henry and his team of sports stars travelled to a few states before heading out to places like China, Burma, Morocco, Egypt, and India. Henry was only called back home because his father had passed away. But by the time he actually arrived back home, he had missed the funeral and his dad was already buried. At this moment, he began to struggle, uh, bought himself a yellow convertible and hit the roads at speed. Those he loved began to leave him or die. Not even training fighters was enough for Henry to cope with what life was now throwing at him. And Thomas Hauser wrote about the troubled time in Henry's life in the and the new, and this is what he said. This is from his that that article or book. So early in 1949, he was driving, allegedly drunk, when stopped by police who did not recognise him. If you put me in jail, I'll put a curse on you, and you'll die within three hours. The ex-champ challenged, but they threw him in the tank anyway. A judge fined, lectured, and then released him. Henry shuffled in a bewildered sorrow to another gin mill to get drunk again. Later that night, he raced his car through the darkness along the beach area as though he wanted to crash, but he says he felt a hand on his shoulder restraining him from self-destruction. He says he felt the hand strike his face. He pulled the car to a stop, ready to fight, but he was alone. As he recalls, I said, you win God, I give up. Right then and there on that dark road, I knew I was heading in the right direction for which I was fated. I knew religion was the only way for me. So he began to study for the ministry and was eventually ordained at the Morning Star Baptist Church in Los Angeles. He explains, Although I had been brought up a Baptist, I do not consider myself a member of any organised religion. I am a Christian, an evangelist who spreads the good work wherever and whenever I can. I had a big home in California with a $5,000 bar that I converted into a pulpit and where I practiced preaching. I didn't have and don't have my own church, but I have preached at many, wherever they'll have me. I have found, because of my name, that people will listen to me, particularly Negroes, but people of all races too, and youngsters. They could never have seen me fight, but they have heard of me or their fathers have told them about me. So, they listen, and I hope I can do them some good, show them how to avoid the mistakes I made. Henry had got involved in politics, and drinking, then religion, and then the fight against drinking. In October of 1954, Henry spoke to the Temple Baptist Church about his drinking. Four years earlier, he had been ordained by his father-in-law, W. L. Strauffer, at the Morning Star Baptist Church. Yeah, so Henry at the Baptist Church um, opened up and continued throughout much of his life to explain the story of when he found God or when God found him, however you want to perceive it. And he said, I would get drunk and drive my car, roaring up and down the streets and didn't care about anything. Once I blacked out. When I came to, I was in the car heading north out of Malibu at 75 miles per hour. I didn't realise I was driving. There seemed to be a presence beside me. 
I lost my taste for whiskey right then. And it's never come back to me again. So by 1956, Henry Armstrong was now divorced after 25 years of marriage with Wilma May Armstrong, who she said she no longer felt loved by him. She said he left me at home and went out alone. Uh, he never showed me any affection. So that's why they eventually divorced. So with that, he returned to familiar surroundings in St. Louis, where he met his high school sweetheart, Velma, and they married. He told one reporter, I have annuities which pay me about $4,000 a year and a property which brings me about $2,000 a year and my wife has some money. In April 1955, Henry spoke to Ted Carroll of The Ring magazine and he spent a few hours with him and Nat Fleischer reminiscing on the years gone by. And he also spoke of what happened to his money. He said, Eddie Mead was a very good manager and I have no complaints. I feel he meant well, but he just wasn't made to handle the kind of money we were getting. I should have watched over my own money, but I didn't. This is my mistake. I didn't know how to take care of money any more than Mead did. He ran through a couple of fortunes of his own before he went through mine as well. Well, Henry did go on to have two children with Velma. Uh, Henrietta and Edna and they all moved on to Los Angeles. Friends of Henry thought he was doing well until Velma passed away. He seemed to be heading back into an oblivion but then he said in his book when there was no place else to turn I found almighty God. Whether it was bad investments, the divorce, the drinking, loss of his wife or whatever he had run out of money by the mid-1960s. Henry then returned to St. Louis and took a job as an assistant director of the Herbert Hoover Boys Club and became a minister at the Mount Olive Baptist Church. He then met Gussie Henry and they married around 1978. She took him out of St. Louis and brought him back to Los Angeles, but Henry's friends believed that he would have been much better off if he had stayed in St. Louis. James Reddick, who had known Armstrong for close to 50 years, explained when he said, We tried not to let him leave here. I know he was getting up in age, getting senile and forgetful but he should have stayed he had the kind of job where basically he didn't do anything and got paid for it people were impressed just because of who he was that was the way it was but it was kind of sad when you're on top people cater to you but once you start slipping you find out who your friends are he didn't have any money when he got here it was gone he didn't have nothing but who can you blame for that nobody but him I hate it for him while Armstrong's financial troubles are widely known in boxing circles and Ray Arcel said such problems are not limited to Henry Armstrong as we know from many of our career profiles when he said most of the fellows who fought in that period wound up either in bad health or dead broke. It's a sad story for boxing. The Los Angeles Times actually wrote a piece on Henry Armstrong on August the 14th 1988 with the headline fight of his life for boxing immortal Henry Armstrong at 75 is enduring tough times again now we're going to read out sections of this article which explains how Henry saw out the final stages of this wonderful life of his and this is where the champ fights now it said down the green carpeted hallway past the nurse's station in the room on the left the television set is on but the champ doesn't see it a vase of daisies and carnations are on the table next to him in the bed that brighten the hospital room with the sun splashing through the window. But he doesn't notice. This is one fight that the champ can't win. There weren't many foes that Henry Armstrong couldn't lick in the ring, but his body is betraying him now. This is not the ring, and it's not 50 years ago when hammering Henry Armstrong slugged his way toward immortality, fame and fortune. The fortune is gone now, more than half a million in winnings that Armstrong earned in a 14-year career. One of the greatest boxers who ever lived is 75, bedridden, nearly blind, broke and dying. Armstrong's third wife, Gussie, said their only income is the monthly social check of $800. She said, you can be rich and have a ball, but it can get away from you. I don't have any money, and he don't have any money. He had a lot taken from him. You think people are honest, but they aren't. This whole thing, what's happened to him, my heart bleeds. I have to smile to keep me from crying. 
On the infrequent occasions that Armstrong isn't in the hospital, Gussie Armstrong cares for him in their small two-bedroom house on East 55th Street in South Central LA. None of Armstrong's boxing trophies, championship rings or belts are there. Gussie said they were stolen. The two sofas in the living room are covered with thick plastic. The bedroom in the back has a hospital bed in it. Cardboard boxes are stacked against the wall and some plaster is missing. The curtains are drawn and the light in the room is dim. This is where Henry Armstrong will fight his final bout as soon as he comes home from the hospital. Gussie won't allow her husband to be taken to a nursing home because she is fearful she will lose the social security money. And she asked, what can I do? I need something to live on. Since January, Armstrong has been admitted six times to Century City Hospital and treated for infections, malnutrition, anemia, pneumonia, dehydration and poor vision. Many of his problems are irreversible and doctors say principally dementia, the loss of intellectual ability. Beset by such physical problems, doctors have not given Armstrong much time. Armstrong is fed through a tube in his stomach which was put there in April after he refused to eat and dropped to £95. His daughter, Lanetta, said she felt estranged from her father. She said he wasn't close to me. He was always on the go. I mostly didn't see him too much. Even so, it was she who sent the flowers to Armstrong's hospital room. Dr Abe Green and Century City Hospital are establishing a fund to benefit Armstrong to help with his home care. Green said, At this point, he's as medically intact as we can get him. I think the major concern should be keeping him comfortable. If he could, Armstrong would probably smile at the sweet irony of this. In his profession, after all, he never ever worried about making anyone comfortable. He fought 181 fights and won 151 of them, 101 by knockout. But now, the champ lies on his hospital bed with the tube in his stomach. It got infected recently when he was at home and he had to come back. His left leg is rigid, drawn up and bent at the knee. That happened when he wasn't moving in his bed at home. The champ doesn't look at all comfortable, but Green said he has his good days and his bad days. And Gussie Armstrong said her husband still has a powerful ally in his corner. She said he's strong. He's always been strong. I remember he used to say, don't give up, keep your guards up. Well, hammering Hank... The one and the only man to hold three world titles in three different weight classes, moving the super divisions, Mr. Henry Armstrong passed away on October the 23rd, 1988 at the age of 75. His widow Gussie told a Los Angeles reporter, he's resting and all his miseries are gone. I did all I could for him and so did everyone else. We're going to end this episode with numerous accolades from those within boxing who heap praise on this superstar. So when he died in October 1988, W.J. Weatherby wrote, He was in the class of Muhammad Ali, Sugar Ray Robinson and Jack Johnson and had the kind of personal independence that made him reject the limitations of racial segregation outside the ring. He was to be seen with white women friends on his arm like his hero Jack Johnson at a time when that could get a black man killed in the United States I live my life he once told a bully in New York you don't live it for me he promptly knocked out the bully and walked on with his lady speaking of Jack Johnson well Jack Johnson was one who had an opinion that nobody ever wasted energy like that boy there is no way in the world he could have lasted any longer than he did fighting that way Ray Arcel said, He was a unique individual, one of the greatest fighters I ever saw. He fought three minutes every round. I saw him in most of his championship fights. Arcel continued and said, He could be classed with the greatest fighters of all time. If you ever wanted to see a fighter, then you would look at him, because this was the kind of guy you would say was a real fighter. The word great is misused a lot when it is used to describe many boxers, but Henry Armstrong was great. Historian Bert Randolph Sugar wrote, No one who ever saw this fighter will ever forget him. A non-stop punching machine, his style more rhythmic than headlong. His matchstick legs akimbo, his arms crossed in front of his face. His likes will never be seen again. Bob McShane, writing 
for a Montana newspaper, wrote, Win, lose or draw, Henry Armstrong always has been the fighter for our money. Pound for pound, Henry just about tops the list of all-time great boxers. Look over the list of ringmen and find one who has done what he has. Matchmaker Don Elbaum recalled, Sugar Ray Robinson told me that Henry Armstrong was an all-time great. Rocky Marciano told me that Henry Armstrong was an all-time great. Willie Pep told me that Henry Armstrong was an all-time great. That tells me all I need to know. Speaking of greats, Benny Leonard said this, Armstrong maintained the most killing pace of any fighter the ring has known. How many fighters in the history of the world have held three ring titles at one time? The world knows the answer to that one. One fighter, Henry Armstrong. Henry Armstrong defeated 16 champions and made a big impression on Detroit trainer and manager Emmanuel Stewart, who said, I look at the films of the old-time fighters a lot. Henry Armstrong is the first boxer I ever saw who was like a machine. It wasn't combinations as much as it was punches coming all the time. Nobody could throw that many punches, but he did. And Emmanuel Stewart elaborated, he said uh, he had an incredible stamina and was absolutely non-stop. It was perpetual motion punching machine, as they always call him. When the bell rang, he got in your face and started throwing punches from every angle. It was like a machine gun. It wasn't bang. It was bang, 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 bang. Nothing stopped him. He just kept coming and coming and punching like a windmill in a hurricane. Thomas Hauser said it best in his book and the new. It's difficult to take a fighter out of one era and know with certainty how he would have performed in another. But the prevailing view is that Armstrong would have been a champion in any era. He's remembered today primarily because he held the featherweight, lightweight and welterweight titles simultaneously. Putting that accomplishment in a larger perspective, the most credible accounting of his fights list him as having 149 wins and 101 knockouts against 21 losses and 10 draws. In the 46 months prior to losing the welterweight title to Fritz Zibic, Armstrong's record was 59-1-1. During his reign as champion, he won 21 titles. He was knocked out only twice in his career. There was a time when he could have beat any fighter in the world from 126 to 147 pounds. And that was during the golden age of boxing, when there was a lot of very good fighters. In his column in June 16, 1944, Harry Grayson said that Armstrong recalled his most toughest opponents and why. And he said, so this is what Armstrong said to Harry Grayson. Ray Robinson was the finest all-round performer I had met. Barney Ross was the most polished boxer. Seferino Garcia was the hardest hitter. Lou Ambers was the cagiest. Baby Arizmendi was the toughest. And Fritzy Zivic was the foulest. And we're just going to run through some of his honours. So 1937, the Ring Magazine named him the fire of the year, which we mentioned. And 1940, the Boxing Writers Association of America, or the BWAA, named him also their fire of the year. In 1954... Armstrong was inducted into the Ring Magazine Boxing Hall of Fame the year it was established. In 1987, he was among those inductees from the Ring List who were absorbed into the International Boxing Hall of Fame when it was established. In 1995, Armstrong was posthumously honoured for his boxing career by being inducted into the St. Louis Walk of Fame. In 2007, the Ring Magazine ranked Armstrong as the second greatest fighter of the last 80 years. Again, in 2007, ESPN ranked Armstrong as number three on their list of the 50 greatest boxers of all time. And we're going to leave you with the last words from Henry Armstrong when he says, When you're champ, you have to keep going to stay on top. You only have a few years to make your money. After that, you're just another has-been. When you're through, you're through. When you're old, you don't get young again. Of course, great advice to any young boxer or anyone reflecting upon life. It's very short, so make the most of it. And that pretty much sums up the morale of Henry Armstrong and his story. And as John Jarrett calls him, boxing's super champ. 
And there we go, ladies and gentlemen. That is the career profile of Henry Armstrong. And just as another side note before we give our final opinions on this, I noticed that in the last year or two, Dougie Fisher, editor-in-chief of The Ring magazine, actually presented his grandson, Edward Armstrong Scott, with a Ring magazine belt to commemorate Henry Armstrong. And that was really nice to also see that. That was another thing that I think was long overdue as well. And to have that posthumously bestowed upon his name and his family's name was also really great to see. And the whole story of Henry Armstrong has been fantastic to cover. And we always knew when we got to someone like Henry that it was going to be one hell of a story. And we always feel this way when we do it because we always get to learn so much about these guys and and really understand what they've been through in their lives and the adversity, the trials and the tribulations, the difficulties that they've faced, just the sheer brilliance of them as people and him as a boxer. And it was really great to learn so much more about Henry. And I hope you guys listening have also been able to take that away from this episode. He is arguably the greatest of all time. People will have that debate. The top three fighters of all time in any particular order could quite easily be Muhammad Ali, Sugar Ray Robinson, Henry Armstrong. And you could change that order up numerous amounts of times. But I think it's quite solidified now that we've done a career profile on all three of those individuals. That is those three individuals that will always be in that top three. Unless someone comes along at some point maybe in our lifetimes and surpasses that by doing something completely unthinkable. Henry Armstrong could quite well be the greatest fighter of all time. That is subjective and that is open to everybody's interpretation. But for me, it's been really good to get to know more about him and his life and everything that he achieved in this sport. A fantastic run as the welterweight champion, even though in some instances he overcame great adversity and essentially it felt like at times politics played a big part in him not keeping those three titles for longer than what he did. I, I definitely, I second that. I, I, I believe that. I mean, the weight was probably an issue for the featherweight title. He couldn't hold that for any longer than he could. What was amazing is how he wins the featherweight title, just skips lightweight and goes and fights a welterweight to win a world title before then going on to collect that lightweight title. I don't think he would have been able to defend the featherweight again because he was just he just was too big at that point. But saying that, he defended that lightweight title and he was never really near that that near near the one four seven pound mark. He was always in and around just, just below one forty. Obviously as he got older he, he grew into that weight. But I mean what an um how active i I mean, we've been through so many great fires. We've done Sugar Ray Robinson and we've done Muhammad Ali. And they're the two guys you would probably say are close to Henry Armstrong. I suppose the argument there for Armstrong to be greater than them two is how active he was. And it wasn't just a fight a month. He was fighting in the same month and defending his world title. It is incredible to think that someone could fight the beginning of June, end of June, defending his title twice. I mean, we talk about inactivity of fighters today. He puts those guys to shame. I'm not saying that fighters should be doing that today, but... Even then, he was active, and many fighters are active, but they just never put their titles on the line. It just didn't seem right. Normally, they would wait. They'd have a few non-title fights, and then have the title fights sort of a few months later, but not not Emery. Amazing. And, and there is footage on there on YouTube. You can see this windmill of non-stop punching, you know, this absolute train. I, I can't even explain it. When you see it, it is unbelievable. It really is. I've never known any of the engine of him. I used to think that Carlos Monzon are probably the best engine in boxing. I've been proven well wrong. I think that's Henry Armstrong without a shadow of a doubt. There's no way a man can throw that amount of punches. You can't believe it, but it's true. And even they done medical checks on him and they said, you know, his his heart or something. I mean, I mean, this is back in the day, but the doctor was physician was saying that his heart is big enough to be as fit as a lightweight kind of thing. Like you could be in a bigger person's body. That's why your volume of punches is so great. But, I mean, what a man, uh, what a sad ending, tragic, as as with all of them. Lose their money, have bad health, and die in a hospital bed. And we just got to keep pushing. I mean, this guy will never be forgotten, though. No one's ever going to repeat what he done. And that's about all I can say. What an absolute legend. And yeah, you're right, So I, I probably would now 
considering we done Charlie Burley recently, I probably would have Henry Armstrong as my number two now. I never, I never thought I'd say that. Uh, it was always Ray Robinson, but for me, yeah, he's my number two. Well, there you go, guys. That is Johnson's opinion, and I'd love to hear what other people's opinions are on where Henry Armstrong sits in the all-time greats list. Does he sit at number one, two, or three? I can't see anybody putting him outside of number three. And if you do put him outside of number three, I would love to hear your reasons why and who you would put in there in place of him because it is very subjective to do these all-time great lists. The one thing that is for sure, I don't think he'll ever be forgotten about. We do these shows, Johnston, to bring a lot of these historical fighters back to life again, metaphorically in the sense that we're able to tell their stories and tell them in their entirety as well. And there are obviously bits of information that family members and people that are still alive that are old enough to to remember what it was like to spend time with Henry could could quite easily elaborate on. Like I mentioned, his grandson, I know his grandson is quite active uh, on social media. I think he's in his 50s now. You know, he could probably have some good memories of, of his granddad and be able to share some of those. Um, but as time goes on, you know, some of these stories do get a little bit forgotten about. And this is what we love doing. We love bringing all these stories to life again and portraying how it must have been for those individuals that we're telling about in the story, that we're talking about, like the difficulties that we faced. And I think one of the biggest themes that I've found with our Career Profiles series over the past few years is that there are a lot of unbelievably great unsung heroes in this sport. Those fighters that were avoided, the Charlie Burleys, the Joe Gans the Sam Langfords, those fighters like that, even Henry Armstrong, he wasn't necessarily avoided, but he was one of the great fighters. And there's a common trend that goes with it. They all are men of colour. They all are black men. And they all face the same racial difficulties during those periods of time that they lived in. And to overcome all that difficulty... Because we're never going to understand truly what it was like for them in that time period to have experienced those issues. We can only get a slight, slight understanding. And I say that very slightly because we're never going to truly know how difficult it was. And I think what we love to do with these shows is try to really give you a feel for what it was like for those individuals and really how much adversity they actually overcame in their lives. And to achieve something like Henry Armstrong did, Well, it was just uh, an amazing feat. And we said it in the first show, and we'll end it on this show. It is a feat that I can't ever, ever see being repeated. So with that in mind, that brings a close to the episode and brings a close to the final episode for Career Profiles of 2023. If you have enjoyed this episode on Henry Armstrong and the show in general, please make sure... You leave us a comment. If you listen on Spotify, it does give you an automatic question to answer. Please leave your thoughts and feelings in there. If you've watched it on YouTube, and should I say listen to it on YouTube, please drop a comment in the box below on the episode to let us know what you think about it. If you're on Spotify and if you're on Apple, please make sure you leave us a rating. Or if the app that you use to listen to this show has a rating system, please leave us a rating and a review on there. It is all very much appreciated if you are a patron to the btr boxing podcast network thank you thank you for supporting us and allowing us to go out there and purchase more literature that allows us to produce high quality episodes like this that allows us to get more literature it allows us to get access to more archives that you have to pay for to be able to understand and truly depict what was really going on during those fights and those periods of time that we cover in shows like this. So thank you to you guys, and I hope that you guys have enjoyed your early access to this episode. And of course, the fact that it is ad-free. Thank you guys for tuning in and subscribing to us. And a final thank you goes out to everybody else that listens to us and that has listened to the show, whether you're a past listener, a present listener, or a long-time listener thank you for listening to the show that is everything for this episode thank you for listening to the career profile of henry armstrong